Again, everyone, Phil Giuliani here again. And this program is One in Messiah here on Messianic Lamb Network. And I'm glad that you tuned in. And if you haven't been with us before, um, One in Messiah is a ministry that's been going for about um, seven and a half years now. And we're based in Cleveland, in the Cleveland area. And we have several different parts of the ministry. This is one part of it. We also have a live uh, Friday evening um, kind of a service. It's kind of an Arab Shabbat, but a little modified. And we meet uh, at Calvary Chapel Church of Cleveland at 709 Brook Park Road. That's in Brooklyn Heights. And if you're in this area, we get there at about 6 15 and i think it would be great if you could stop in and say hello and uh we can get to know each other and talk a little bit and then uh, those sessions are also recorded and put on the youtube channel that i have as are these teachings on um that we do on lamb network and so what we do in this ministry is it's based on Ephesians 2, 14 and 15, which says that Yeshua in his flesh broke down the partition between the two, making one new man. So you've heard of one new man ministries. This is a one new man ministry. Um, and the other scripture that I always like to use is John five thirty nine, where Yeshua says, the scriptures testify of me. And this is what it's based on. We connect passages from the Tanakh with the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, because everything in Torah, everything in the prophets, of course, points to him. And all of the study that you've done in Torah points to him. And we are in the New Covenant, which is... In many ways, a continuation of the old, but in very important ways, different than the old. And this is what we do in our ministry. This is what the teachings are are based on. And today, we're going to do a teaching that is really kind of a um, powerful connection between the two covenants between the two testaments. In fact, it's going to connect Genesis and the Gospel of John. So that that's going to be a great example of, of what I'm talking about. And at, at the end, I'll uh, give some information about websites and the YouTube channel and the podcast and um, some other things. But I want to get into the teaching because... As you know, time moves along rather quickly. And sometimes we're kind of rushed at the end to hurry up and finish <laughs> for whatever I have in my notes and on the PowerPoint and so forth. So we're going to get started. We'll talk about the sites um, at the end a little bit later. So it's so important to understand the roots and foundations of what our faith is based on how it is um, explained through all of the scripture. Because after all, when Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, he says all scripture is God-breathed. He doesn't say some of it is. He doesn't say, well, the Old Testament used to be, but now it's not anymore, because now we have the New Testament. He doesn't say, well, this part's good, this part not so much. All of it is God breathed. It's all inspired. 
actually expired by the Holy Spirit, the Ruach, and inspired by the writers. And the connection between the Tanakh and the New Testament, of course, is for the sake of completeness. I don't remember who it was, but a radio Bible teacher mentioned that he always gets upset when he sees the blank white page when the book of Malachi ends, and then you turn over the blank white page and it says the New Testament, that the white page shouldn't be there because it gives the impression of this is a division. And so it is a continuum. It's a panorama of salvation history that starts in Genesis, ends at the end of the book of Revelation, um, a time that we seem to be living in now, but that's another story. And so it's, it's so important. And um, as I like to tell my friends who are pastors and are involved in so much Bible study and activities in churches and so forth, that the scripture does not start in Matthew 1, 1, it starts in Genesis 1, 1. And everything that comes before Matthew 1, 1 is critically important to what happens when Messiah comes and what happens as the new covenant is instituted by him. And so it's important to study Torah. It's important to study the prophets. It's important to understand how all these elements in the Tanakh point to Messiah. So tonight we're going to have a teaching called The Ladder. And you'll see why it's called that in a minute, because it has to do with a ladder that's mentioned by Jacob, Yaakov, the patriarch, um, who was a pretty interesting guy and is another great example of people being used by God despite their personalities, despite their shortcomings, and their, despite their humanity, so to speak. And we're going to connect that with somebody in John's gospel that we can also say is used despite his shortcomings, despite his human attributes, and, and so forth. And so we're going to go to Genesis 28. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger here. So we're going to go to Genesis 28. You all know this story. And when I talk about Yaakov, Jacob having his human frailties, this is, of course, after he deceives his father, his aging father, who's sight is diminished the deceit is so blatant and he's helped by his mother rebecca rivka helps jacob deceive his father her husband and when you look at it from kind of like the human story of it, it's, you know, you kind of shake your head and say, this is horrible. What are they trying? Uh, why are they deceiving this poor old guy who can't see and is going to die soon? And so the deceit happens and, you know, Esau gets mad and Esau at first doesn't care about his birthright and he sells it for a bowl of red stew or a lentil stew or whatever it was, but it was red like he was. And he gave up his birthright for a bowl of stew because he said, he admitted he didn't care about his birthright. Didn't care about his birthright. It didn't mean anything to him. He was more concerned with his life, with the things of the world, with feeding himself and this sort of thing. But then when he finds out that Jacob has deceived their father, Isaac. He gets angry. And of course, Rebecca makes the plan to get Jacob out and to her uncle Laban's house. 
And so Jacob is on his way to Laban's house where, of course, the rest of the story unfolds and he's going to be at Laban's house for a long time. He's going to marry two of Laban's daughters. And in case you, you don't think that that's enough, he's also going to be with two of the servant women to produce the 12 tribes, to produce the 12 sons. So, and that's another sordid story, but all this is worked out um, in the whole plan of salvation because Messiah Yeshua has his humanity that comes from these patriarchs. His humanity comes from the fact that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were given the promises. They were given the promises that from them certain things were going to happen. They were going to have land. They were going to have descendants. And more, most importantly, to those of us who are Gentiles, that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through them. All the nations of the earth would be dread, would be blessed through Abraham. And then the, it's repeated to Isaac. And as we're going to say, see in a minute, it's also repeated to Jacob. And then it's going to go to Judah, who was pretty much of a creep, wants to kill his brother, has all kind of sordid business with wife and daughter-in-law. And you can't even, you couldn't even make this stuff up and make a movie out of it. But all these things lead to the physical human nature of Yeshua, the physical human nature of the God man, the Messiah. And so Jacob, I'm kind of giving the whole context, but I don't want to get away from what we're talking about. Jacob then is off to go to Laban's house. You can read the details for your homework and the immediate chapters before and a few chapters after this. But in verse 28.10 says, Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head. And he lay down in that place to sleep. So he starts off the journey. The sun goes down to us. That doesn't really mean much because we have lights. We have cars that have lights. We have any number of things that make lights, flashlights, screens. And this time when the sun went down, everything was pitch black. And like Yeshua even says in one of the gospels, that when it's dark, when it's night, no one can work. Thus, that makes no sense because we can work perfectly fine at two o'clock in the morning. Because if we're in a room without windows and all the lights are on, we don't know if it's two o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon. We can still work. When things got dark at this time, your working was done. And so Jacob has to stop at this certain place because the sun's gone down. It's too dark. You can't walk. You can't walk with, even if you have a horse, no matter how you're doing it, there's no way. You can't find your way, can't find your directions. So he has to stop and <clears throat> he lies down for the night and, you know, uses a stone for a pillow. I mean, this is definitely not like the Mr. Pillow guy on TV. He sleeps on a rock. So he was much tougher than, than people today are. So he uses this as a, as a pillow and he goes to sleep. And while he's asleep, keep in mind he's asleep when this happens. 17. Then he dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. So he has a dream. It's a ladder. The bottom of the ladder is on earth. The top of the ladder reaches up to heaven 
and he sees angels, angels going up and down the ladder, ascending and descending on the ladder. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Now, very commonly, as you know, in Tanakh, when God introduces himself, he introduces himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, here, he happens to be talking to Jacob. So he says, I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac. I'm the God of your grandfather and your father. So when he does this, in so many other places in the Tanakh, it, it's so there is no question about who's talking. There's no question of who this is. Now, God has not given them his name as of yet. Remember in Exodus, he says, I loved Abraham, but I never told Abraham my name. But you, meaning Moses, I told my name too. So it, at this point, you don't know God's name, but he says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he repeats two of the promises to Jacob. And this is a dream. And he repeats the two, two promises, which are the land you're on, I'm giving to you and your descendants, which means this land is going to be yours and you're going to have descendants who are going to live in this land. So it's basically repeating the promises that God had originally made to Abraham when he was 75 years old, living in the land of Ur, in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley in Mesopotamia, some years before this, and so Jacob gets this promise and he's having a dream. And he dreams of a ladder. If you, if you know anything about electricity, you know, you probably fooled around with this in, I don't know, high school physics class or whatever, where you make Jacob's ladder and you pass a current between two pieces of metal that are separated like this and the current jumps and goes up the ladder. And that's called Jacob's Ladder, not because the people who do that are particularly knowledgeable about Torah, but because it, it, it does refer back to this. So he dreams the ladder, and in the dream, he sees angels ascending and descending on it. So keep that in mind, because it's going to be important in a little while. And it says that the Lord stood above it. So God, the Lord, all capital letters, stood above it, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Jacob's on the earth. There's a ladder. God's above the ladder. And Jacob has the promises that were made to his father and grandfather repeated to him to a large extent, at least so far the first two promises. And keep in mind, he's asleep. Verse 15, behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. So God says, I'm not going to leave you. I'm always going to be with you and I'm going to bring you back to this land. And this not only applies to physical Jacob, the supplanter, the, the one who was ready to deceive, and he's a little while he's going to deceive his uncle Laban too, deceive his father, deceive his uncle, you know, do whatever he has to do to get the birthright. Um, he's a supplanter. He wants it. And God says, I'm going to be with you and wherever you go. So he, though, is going to give rise, as you know, to the people. His name is going to be changed to Israel, 
and the people are going to be known as Israel. People aren't known as Abraham. They're not known as Isaac. Nobody calls the country Yitzhak. Nobody calls the country Abraham. The country's called Israel, which was Jacob's name. I have struggled with God or wrestled with God because of the, the incident with the with the wrestling and his having his hip dislocated. But that's also another story. So wherever you go, I'm going to bring you back to this land. So because he's going to end up giving rise to the nation, because the 12 sons that he is going to give birth to with Leah, Rachel, and the two servant women are going to be the 12 tribes, are going to give rise to the whole nation. They're giving rise to the 12 tribes. Everybody knows there were 12 tribes of Israel. And it, 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 you should know about that. And you should know how these boys slash men came into existence. We know that Judah, Yehuda, comes from Leah and is the line that leads to Messiah Yeshua. It is the line that leads to the kings, King David, down to both Joseph and Mary, who were from the line of David, to Yeshua the Messiah, who was from the tribe of Judah. Yehuda means to praise God. Well, Judah, as you know, was a bit of a character as well. Kill his brother, sell his brother, but we're not going to get into all that. But eventually, the people, the Israelites in the north, are going to essentially disappear. From historical eyes, they disappear. God knows where they are. In 70 AD, the people living in the southern kingdom are going to be scattered throughout the world and almost the whole nation was in diaspora for 1800 and some years almost the whole nation there were very few jews in the land so god says to jacob who is israel although his name hasn't been changed yet wherever you go i'm going to bring you back here because i'm doing a work through you you're going to give rise to the chosen people I'm going to reveal, he doesn't tell him all this because Jacob would have no way to process this, but what he's telling Jacob in essence is he, through you is going to come the physical line of Messiah because Messiah, in order to do his work, has to have both the divine and a human nature. He has to be the God-man. You're going to provide the man part of that. The God part of it already exists. You are going to provide the man part of that. So through you is going to come this. This is going to happen through your descendants, just like I told your grandfather and just like I told your father. But I'm not going to leave you or forsake you or abandon you because this has to be done. And the other part of this amazing prophecy here is that no matter where you go, I'm going to bring you back to the land. People went to Babylon, came back to the land. People were scattered in diaspora through the whole world. 1948, coming back to the land. They're still going to the land. So this ends up being a prophecy that actually we've seen pretty in 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 many of our lifetimes we've seen the population of israel the land of israel eretz israel go from three million people to now there's over eight million people we've seen people from Ethiopia, people from India, people from China, people from different places who are known to have Hebrew roots, are known to be Jews, airlifted to the land 
and are living there now. Massive numbers of people from Russia and Ukraine, the places in the former Soviet Union. You know, on our trips to Israel, my wife and I have met many of these people who are pastoring um, congregations in Galilee, are involved in evangelizing their fellow Jews in the land, but they were brought there from somewhere else. And there's so many of the major prophets, Ezekiel especially, about where God says, I'm going to bring you back to the land. And after I bring you back, you're not going to be displaced anymore. They're not going to be displaced anymore. So here he says, I am with you. We don't know that his name is I am yet, but because I am with you. And no matter where you go, I'm bringing you back to the land. And I'm always going to be with you. Verse 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? Remember, he had a dream when this was revealed to him. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So he wakes up from the sound sleep. You know, many times God communicates with people in dreams. We know that Joseph, uh, Jacob's son Joseph, interpreted dreams. Daniel interpreted dreams. Joseph, Mary's husband, the foster father of Messiah, had dreams about angels telling him, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. He's carrying a holy child. Then later it's take the child and his mother and go to Egypt because he's Herod is seeking his life. There's communication in dreams. Here, Jacob has this awesome communication in a dream. And he says, wow, God was here and I didn't even know it. So to him, seeing God in the dream, seeing this whole dream unfold with the ladder and God being there and the angels going up and down was a real experience. Because in a way, it was a real experience. It was a communication to him. And then when he realized what he was saying, it says he was afraid. This is fear in terms of awe. He couldn't believe such a thing would happen to him. Wouldn't believe such a thing happened right in this place while he was asleep. So he says, how awesome is this place that God was here? How awesome is this place? So he says, this is the house of God. And he names the place Bethel, the house of God. You've seen churches, you know, with this word, and 99% of the time it's called Bethel. You see Bethel this and Bethel that and Bethel something or other ministry and Bethel Baptist Church somewhere. But the house, the place he is in is Bethel, the house of God. L's the important part of the word. So he says, this is the gate of heaven. In other words, I saw the ladder that gets to heaven, and I even saw angels going up and down. You know, angels are messengers. You know, we use the Greek word from angelos, the messenger. In Hebrew, it's malach, messenger. They're messengers. You know, in the book of Hebrews, it says they're ministering spirits. We see so many times that all through the scripture, when an angel comes to give someone a message, when an angel comes to show somebody something, you know, it, 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 in, in the New Testament, of course, we have Gabriel telling Mary that she's going to bear a son. And he's going to be named Yeshua, and he's going to be the son of the Most High. We have angel interacting with Joseph, saying, don't be afraid of all of this. We have angel interacting with Zechariah, saying, you you and Elizabeth are going to have a baby too. 
We have angels announcing the resurrection, the, the birth of Messiah. We have angels announcing the resurrection. We have angels at the ascension. We have angels uh, through the book of Acts doing various things. They're ministering spirits. They're sent. They're messengers. So it kind of makes sense in a simplistic way that they're going up and down the ladder. They come to earth to do certain things. They go back to heaven and you're going up and down on this ladder. So Jacob sees this as a very real thing, even though he was asleep. Even though he was asleep, it was a vision that was in fact real. And then of course he goes on the journey and, you can read all that for your homework about what happens, what happens when he goes to Laban's house, uh, gets his wives and so forth and so forth. So Bethel, the ladder, Jacob's ladder, promises repeated. I'm never going to leave you. I'm always going to be with you. No matter where you go, I'm going to bring you here. So now we're going to go to the New Testament, to the Brit Hadashah. We're going to go to John's Gospel. Chapter one, where we're going to have, you know, there's some main characters here. And as you know, the book of John, John writes his gospel kind of paralleling Genesis. First day, the second day, the next day, the next day. Kind of culminating in a wedding feast, which is not coincidental because we're the bride of Messiah. You know, the church is the bride of Christ. The body of Messiah is the bride of Messiah. The bridal paradigm that goes through all of the scripture. So here we have men that are called and we have Andrew and then he goes to get Simon. And we have Philip who's called directly and he goes to get Nathaniel. And we're going to, we're going to concentrate on Nathaniel because he's going to be the connection to this passion, passage in Genesis that we just went through. And I know you all know the story, but we're going to go through it. Not that you don't know the story, but we're going to go through it to kind of connect the two passages. So we're going to go to John 1 starting in 45. And this is a great, all of these people that I mentioned are a great example of when somebody meets Yeshua, their reaction is not, yep, I met him, glad I met him. I'm sure he's going to have some, you know, it's going to be of some benefit to my life. My life is a little more full now. Uh, I'm sure this is going to add something to my life and this glad. No, they're so moved. We're so moved when we meet him. They're so moved when they meet him that they go immediately to tell people about it. <clears throat> and we don't even have time to go through all the examples, but the easy ones are the woman at the well who goes and tells her whole village about this. And they come out and they say, wow. They all become believers and they say, wow, you know, we first we heard her testimony and we believed it. But now we're hearing you speak and now we really believe it. And we're going to go tell other people about it. You know, all these people, you know, Andrew comes and then Andrew goes and gets his brother. Yeshua calls Philip and then he goes and gets his friend Nathaniel. So John 1 45, Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, right away here, we have something to point out. How important is the Tanakh? How important is the Tanakh in biblical history, in the life of Yeshua, in the plan of salvation? It's infinitely valuable because here, now Philip is a Jew, Nathaniel is a Jew, so they understand this terminology. Unfortunately, we have people 
in most churches that don't really care about this, don't, aren't really, don't really think this is important. But you see how Philip approaches this. We found him, capital H, that Moses wrote about in the law and that the prophets wrote about. Moses wrote the Torah. Moses wrote the five books of the Torah, the Pentateuch, the books of Moses. You can search through all of those five books, every word, every letter, every sentence. You won't see the word Jesus, Yeshua. You won't see, oh, and by the way, Messiah's coming, his name's going to be Yeshua. What you're going to see is prefigurements and foretellings and points. And I don't even know what are good terms to use. So even in, you know, I mentioned John chapter 5, a little earlier than that verse 39, I don't remember the exact verse, probably around 30, where Yeshua says, if you believe Moses, you would believe me because Moses wrote about me. You know, the Pharisees were quick to point out, you know, when he healed the blind man and, you know, all, so many stories. They were easy, They were quick to point out, we're disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. We don't know who this guy is. We don't get this. We don't know who this guy is. But we know Moses. We know Moses. We're disciples of Moses. You know, we're these holy guys here. We follow Moses. And Yeshua tells them, if you if, if you do Moses, if you believe Moses, you would believe me. Why? Because Moses wrote about me. That's what he was writing about. He wasn't writing all these things so that you could have your religion. He was writing these things because they pointed to me. And the prophets, of course, all pointed to him as well. It's not just Torah, it's Moses and the prophets. It's a transfiguration. There's Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets. Philip is telling Nathaniel, the law and the prophets. We found who the law and the prophets talk about. The law talks about a person. The prophets talk about a person who is Messiah. The law doesn't exist just to have a way to live your life. It is a way to live your life. It's a framework to live your life. But that could be done without a Messiah. It points to Messiah. It points to grace. It points to new covenant. And so do the prophets, not just Jeremiah 31, but Isaiah talks incessantly about salvation through a suffering servant and Gentiles coming. And this is why in Romans, Paul points out that if anybody should have known that Yeshua is the Messiah, it should have been those guys who wore all the cool stuff and knew all the scripture. They should have figured this out. So he tells, so Philip tells Nathaniel, we found the one that Moses and the prophets talk about is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Philip had just met him. We don't know the time frame, but it wasn't like two months earlier. He had just met him. It might have been the same day. It might have been a day or two before. He had just met him. He already went to tell someone about it. And the fact that he mentions Moses and the prophets shows us that in Nathaniel's mind, he, he feels, he's convinced that the scriptures have been fulfilled. All of Torah, all of the prophets. He could have added the Psalms and the other writings. He knew scripture. We don't know how well he knew scripture. He heard the readings every Shabbat. And he's convinced that in this man that he had just met, the scriptures were fulfilled. That's really pretty amazing. The religious leaders who knew I was going to say chapter and verse, but of course there were no chapters and verses. Who knew every word of those writings didn't believe that. And Nathaniel said, okay, now here comes human Nathaniel. Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? 
what are you talking about? Nazareth. Nathaniel was from Cana, so, you know, not exactly a thriving metropolis. They were both pretty dumpy towns. Cana's a pretty dumpy town now. We've been there many times. It's interesting. Nazareth is big now, but of course it wasn't big at this time. But can anything good come out of Nazareth? Everybody knows this line. This is a kind of a common um, insult, kind of a common mockery. <laughs> Nazareth, what are you talking about? It's a pretty dumpy place. Isn't the Messiah going to come from Jerusalem? Is he going to live in the temple? Well, as a matter of fact, no, because the scriptures say he'll be called a Nazarene. But anyway, Philip ignores the insult. He doesn't say, hey, let me tell you something. Hey, maybe you think Nazareth is a pretty dumpy place, but let me tell you something. I've heard him talk. And you go, no, he says, come and see. Come and see what you think. Come and see if you're still going to feel this way after you talk to him, after you hear him talk. We don't know if Philip knows what's going to happen. Might have been inspired by the Holy Spirit to do this in this particular way, probably. So Philip leads him, evangelizes him. He initially, Nathaniel initially kind of rejects it. Philip says, come and see. But now Nathaniel doesn't say, hey, look, if you're going to take me to see a guy from Nazareth, forget it. I'm from Cana. I knew plenty of people from Nazareth. You can see Nazareth from Cana if you've been there. It's not very far at all. Easily walk, walking distance. Well, probably not for us weaklings, but at the time, it was an easy walking distance. But he goes with them. He doesn't argue with them. He doesn't say, no way am I going to go. He goes with them. 47. Then Yeshua saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathaniel said to him, how do you know me? Now, we don't know if Yeshua heard the can anything good come out of Nazareth comment physically with an earshot, heard it supernaturally. We don't know if he heard it at all. But when he sees Nathaniel coming, he says, behold, a true Israelite in whom there's no deceit. He had just insulted him. He, little H, had just insulted him, capital H. But he says, there's no deceit in this guy. Yeshua knows him to be good, to be honest, to be modest. Knows he can use him to serve, knows that he will serve. <laughs> he excuses his insult. Doesn't mention his insult. And says he's a true Israelite? He's a true follower? He's a true person of God? A true chosen person? So he's going to use Nathaniel despite his weaknesses. It's like he's going to use us despite our weaknesses. And like, you know, I always say, if God only used holy people to get things done, nothing would ever be done. Because there isn't anyone who's holy. So despite Nathaniel's mockery and insult and Yeshua knows the true guy and says, yeah, yeah it's true Israelite. This is going to be good. You know, he, I can use him. So Nathaniel said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Wow, we don't know how this happened, when it happened, but Yeshua saw Nathanael sitting under a fig tree. Now, fig trees have a lot of importance, as you know, 
Big Tree represents Israel. People commonly sat under fig trees to read, to study, to discuss the law, to discuss the fact that Messiah was going to come at, at some point, at some time. Nathaniel was sitting under a fig tree. You know, if you're watching the series, The Chosen, you see they made a whole story around Nathaniel, which is interesting, but we don't know if it's really true because it's not mentioned in scripture. What Nathaniel does, what he was doing under the fig tree, but in the in the series, The Chosen, they weave actually a pretty powerful story of he's crying out to God and then when he meets Yeshua, Yeshua says his exact words back to him. So it's a meaning, I saw you under the fig tree, heard you under the fig tree. So he says, when I saw you under the fig tree, I knew you. So maybe he knew him supernaturally. Maybe he had seen him praying or reading scripture because he sees in secret. He knew his heart. Nathaniel wasn't like the hypocrites that wore all the cool stuff. It wasn't like one of the hypocrites who knew every word of the law, but not what the meaning of the law was, that were convinced themselves and convinced everyone else that they were holy and the person they were talking to was not holy. Nathaniel was not like that. He was a real person. He was a true Israelite. He wasn't like those hypocrites. And Yeshua had seen him somehow and also knew his heart. Now, this is the, the amazing part, 49, verse 49. This is the man who just minutes ago or however long ago said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He asked the question, how do you know me? Verse 49, Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Whoa. What a conversion story. What a testimony. I mean, I love hearing people's testimonies. Everybody loves hearing testimonies. You probably like hearing people's testimonies. But this is a testimony of, oh, come on, give me a break. You saw the you met the one who Moses and the prophets talked about. And he's from Nazareth. Come on, are you kidding me? To Rabbi, you're the son of God, you're the king of Israel. What a testimony. I mean, that's awesome. So he gives a full confession of faith now. His doubts are gone. I mean, he doesn't he wouldn't say you're the son of God if he had any doubts. I mean, for a Jewish man to say that is so profound that we can't even put it into words. Because if he's not the son of God, this would be utter blasphemy. Because you're the son of God. He's saying, you're the Messiah. I believe this now. So, you know, it's the old formula that Paul says, you know, he believes in his heart and he confesses with his mouth. You believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, then you'll be saved. Nathaniel does that. So his doubts are gone. He believes it and he speaks it out. So in, in referring to Messiah's humanity, he calls him rabbi. Referring to his divinity, he calls him the son of God. He's admitting that this person he's talking to has both natures. He's the God man. And he adds he's the king of Israel, which is his title, being the son of David. The angel Gabriel, getting back to that, the angel Gabriel told Mary that you're going to name your son Yeshua, and he's going to sit on, on the throne of David, his father, and he's going to sit there forever. Here, Nathaniel calls him king of Israel. So he's not only saying, in your humanity, you're the teacher, you're the rabbi. In your divinity, you're the son of God. You're also the king of Israel because also in your humanity, 
You're descended from David. You're in the royal family. You're in the tribe of Judah. You're from the line of David. So therefore, you're even physically, legitimately the king of Israel. You're the one that we've been waiting for. You're the Messiah we've been waiting for all these centuries, these, I don't know, millennia since Genesis 3.15. So he has the right to be king, has the descent to be king, and of course, as God, he is the king, not only of Israel, but he's the king of kings. Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 1 that he holds the whole universe together. So Nathaniel kind of says all of that in that one sentence, which is his profession of faith. I mean, talk about a powerful sentence. It's a whole profession of faith in the humanity and the divinity of Yeshua. Yeshua answered him and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater than these. So just because I said I saw you under the fig tree, you believe? He almost, Yeshua almost seems surprised. We don't know the tone of voice that he had when he said that. I mean, obviously, Nathaniel was prepared ahead of time, was called. Meeting Yeshua had a profound effect on him. Holy Spirit had acted on him to make this statement of faith. Because we know in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say 10% of people, 80% of people, some people, somebody here and there. He says no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And Nathaniel has said, your Lord, your King, your teacher, you're all these things because the Holy Spirit acted on him. This was, of course, all prepared ahead of time. So what an amazing interaction we have there. Verse 51. So this is Yeshua talking again. And he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Wait a minute. Jacob was asleep. He saw a ladder. God was at the top of the ladder. Angels were going up and down. Yeshua says to Nathaniel, you're going to see heaven open up. You're going to see angels ascending and descending on a ladder? No, on the Son of Man. What is he talking about here? So because of his faith, Nathaniel is going to see great things. More is going to be revealed to him. He's going to see heaven open up. And Yeshua assures him of this. He says, I assure you that because of your faith, this is going to happen. You're going to see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. <coughs> He's the ladder. Jacob saw a physical-looking ladder between heaven and earth, angels ascending and descending. Yeshua, and he was asleep. Nathaniel is awake. In the Genesis account, God is above. In the John Gospel account, God is standing with Nathaniel in the person of Yeshua. The fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus of Nazareth. Paul also writes in Colossians chapter 1 and chapter 2. So God is standing beside him, not above him. And he's going to see angels going up and down because Yeshua is the ladder between heaven and earth. He's the bridge. And this, this is truly, it was for Jacob, but this is truly, capital T, the house of God. This is the true Bethel. This is the true gate of heaven because he is the only way to heaven. He is the only way to salvation. He is the only way that the gospel is brought to earth, the good news is brought to earth. And Nathaniel is going to have a part in that. Nathaniel is going to experience this, 
and we know in a very physical way. And we who have also met him also experienced this in a very real way, not always physical, but in a very real way. Tradition says that Nathaniel was martyred in Armenia, preaching the gospel, and he was skinned alive. So for him, it wasn't just a casual statement of faith. He was martyred for it. We probably won't be, might be, we don't know. But this faith of Nathaniel led to him being used in this Inflammation of the gospel, connected back to the ladder that Jacob saw while he was asleep. So that, I just think that's a, an awesome, both stories are awesome, and it, it's a remarkable connection. It's a remarkable um, complementary gospel that he's the ladder and angels are ascending and descending on him. And Nathaniel is going to have a part of this. Whew. I only have a less than a minute left. So YouTube channel, One in Messiah, Gift of Grace Ministries. I know it's an awkward title. One in Messiah, Gift of Grace Ministries. Go there. There's all kinds of stuff. Podcast, Dr. Phil slash Gift of Grace. There's 800 and some podcasts. Two websites that you see there. So, um... Thanks for being with me, and I hope you come back again next week. And have an awesome week. Mm -hmm.